Visions of Iserman by Zachary Cullen, Chapter 6, Howry. In my neck of the woods, at least, hockey season did not begin in earnest until the end of college football season. Dad kept tabs on the Red Wings throughout the fall, of course, and I stayed up to date on highlights from SportsCenter watching games during the week on ESPN and Fox Sports Detroit. But Saturdays in autumn were for Michigan football at my house. In Millwood, the front porches proudly waved Michigan and Michigan State flags. To their credit, the Fiddlers loyally flew their green flag displaying the white block S throughout the Spartans' dismal 90s doldrums, along with the occasional Western or Central flag until the annual Michigan-Ohio State game passed, and the porches traded their respective collegiate allegiances for Red Wings flags in unison. That August, Dad took me to my first game at the Big House for the 1995 Pigskin Classic between Michigan and Virginia. It was a scorching 95 degrees that afternoon in Ann Arbor, and it felt even hotter on the metal bleachers. Michigan down five, 100,000 fans stood for the final minute of the game, such that Dad had to hold me up to see. From his shoulders, I watched Scott Dreisbach connect with Mercury Hayes in the corner of the end zone as time expired, forever changing the trajectory of my life thereafter. Thenceforward, Michigan football Saturdays became the focal point of my week. Saturday mornings, I loved waking up early, putting on my Michigan jersey, eating breakfast, watching cartoons, and bringing my youth-sized Michigan football, navy blue with yellow laces, to the backyard, where I tossed it back and forth to myself carrying on an endless cycle of fictional college football seasons. I made up team names, like the Boston Blueberries, Rhode Island Raspberries, Arkansas Aardvarks, and Texas Twisters. Then player names, such as Quinn Johnson, Diallo Sanders, and the great blue chip quarterback Dylan Winston, whose identity was based loosely on Florida Gators quarterback Danny Werfel and I kept standings, scores, statistics, and Heisman frontrunner polls in a vast library that existed in my imagination. Mimicking sports center highlights, I acted out the big plays of big games, calling hike from the line of scrimmage, dropping back and dodging trees, arcing a high spiral through the colored leaves, and finally catching the ball in the end zone or intercepting a pass and returning it to the Reschke's backyard next door, always mouthing the roar of a crowd at a college football stadium and spiking the ball, then repeating the process with variations on play calls and angles and different teams. Mom made chili for game days every Saturday, and when I returned from my backyard play, I'd sit down in front of the television with a bowl of it and watch Michigan run out of that tunnel. Sometimes, a bad Michigan football loss turned me in the direction of the Red Wings early in the regular season. Such was the case on Saturday, November 4th, 1995, a date on which both teams were in action, something that had, hadn't happened the previous season on account of the NHL lockout. My family went over to the Racines in the early afternoon to watch the annual Michigan-Michigan State rivalry game on TV, a custom that was more or less tradition in my childhood. Back then, watching in a divided house, with allegiances between Spartans and Wolverines divided pretty evenly, and tolerating the petty barbs and immaturity that inevitably resulted from such parties, did not bother me so much. I accepted the social division that the game engendered as part of the fun. The Racines, the Rivards, and Mrs. Racines' obnoxious brothers 
Richard and Pete, wore green and white on one side of the living room, while the Tantillos, their two daughters, my mom, and my Aunt Kath were in my corner, wearing maize and blue. Few remained neutral, though Uncle Frank cared little for football, and Dad waffled back and forth over the years. Ranked number seven nationally, seven and one Michigan was the betting favorite to retain the Paul Bunyan Trophy, but unseasonably cold weather in East Lansing and a raucous student section imbued the game with a sense of foreboding from the opening kickoff. First year Michigan State coach Nick Saban, utilizing the strengths of his inherited team, devised a game plan that saw Spartan quarterback Tony Banks and wide receivers Derek Mason and Mushin Muhammad carve up the Wolverines' defense in the first half. Snow flurries developed during the second half, and temperatures dipped to 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Just a magical feeling in Spartan Stadium tonight. You can feel something special about to happen, the ABC announcer predicted. Walk-on quarterback Brian Greasy led a furious fourth-quarter comeback to give Michigan a 25-21 lead, but with only a minute left in the game, Tony Banks connected with Nigeria Carter for a 25-yard touchdown pass that proved the game winner and set the Spartan faithful to celebration. Many rushed the field, at which I shook my head in disgust. To hell with Michigan, Pete Iwasik, Mrs. Racine's eccentric brother, shouted belligerently. How you like that, he danced. How you like that? For the first time, but certainly not the last, I cried over a Michigan loss, and in my shame over my inability to restrain my emotions, I ducked out of the big living room on the main floor and into the dining room, with the big Persian rug covering almost all of the varnished wood floor there in an elaborate oval. I crossed through the white tiled kitchen, my head turned to the floor, and finally sulked to the landing above the basement staircase. The Racines had a great basement. Located across from the exterior side door, the basement staircase descended to a narrow hallway with green shag carpet and walls striped vertically in green and white wallpaper. At the end of the short hall, there were three cased opening doorways, one to the left, one straight ahead, as if an extension to the hall, and one to the right, and I peeked my head around each of the side entrances. The doorway on the left opened to a room dominated by a championship green billiards table, while the doorway on the right, a steel pull-up bar tensioned into its width, opened to a room that was either off-limits or uninteresting to us because it housed Mr. Racine's home brewing machinations and a keg refrigerator, plus junk storage. I entered the middle cased opening, leading to the entertainment room. Within that room, where we often played as kids, the hall's shag green carpet extended to cover three quarters of the room on its left side, where a leather couch, recliner, and toy chest faced a big screen TV and stereo system built into golden oak cabinetry, while the far right corner of the room was tiled in a black and white checkerboard pattern. Three bar stools pulled up to a brick mini bar there, Mr. Racine's bar. It was topped with a glossy mahogany tabletop surface, fully stocked in back with three rows of green, amber, and clear liquor bottles that reflected against a wall-length mirror behind the bar. From the mini fridge behind the bar, I found a cold can of Barg's root beer, then climbed up on one of the bar stools and opened the tab. Sipping it, I examined the colorful assortment of coasters with pictures of various drinking establishments and beer brand logos on them, a matchbox collection in a glass jar, and the three miniature flagpoles mounted from sticks in a bottle. 
the American flag, the Canadian flag, and the Jolly Roger. In many respects, Mr. Racine's bar served as my first bar of refuge. Long before I started drinking alcohol, I felt drawn to that subterranean space for the sense of sports and music history the decor suggested. The red brick base of the bar extended to the far wall and continued around the circumference of the room such that the entertainment room's walls were half red brick from floor to bar level and half white concrete above with a thin mahogany ledge shelf in between, also spanning the circumference of the room. On the ledge shelf, Mr. Racine displayed historical sports artifacts, from autographed baseballs in glass cases to bobblehead figures and an assortment of hockey pucks. Hung from the brick facade of the ledge in spaced intervals were Michigan State, Red Wings, Tigers, Pistons and Lions pennants, and above the ledge, hung on the white concrete walls, were framed covers of the Detroit Free Press, including the cover from the 1984 Detroit Tigers World Series, with Kirk Gibson pictured underneath the word, great, in bold letters, a roar of ecstasy on his thickly mustached face. The covers from back-to-back -back Pistons championships, Not Bad Boys and Sweet Repeat, both featuring Isaiah Thomas, and a 1979 cover featuring Magic Johnson and the NCAA champion Michigan State Spartans, in addition to smaller framed portraits of Tiger Stadium, Gordie Howe, Bruce Springsteen, Neil Young, and Tom Petty. Contemplating Mr. Racine's sports and music memorabilia, the loss to Michigan State slipped gradually from my mind. Carrying my root beer from the bar, I sat down on the recliner and turned on the television with the remote, then flipped through the channels until I found the Red Wings Dallas Stars game. A 7.30 start at Joe Louis Arena, it conveniently started shortly after the football game ended. I found comfort in the solitude I had in the basement, and in the fact that, at college football season's near closing, the Red Wings were beginning in earnest another legitimate quest for the Stanley Cup. It provided an opportunity to recycle the negative emotions accumulated from a lost chance at a Big Ten title, exchange them for the promising idealism of a young Red Wings season. A chance to begin afresh. Dave Strader and Mickey Redman were still announcing the starting lineups when I found the game on television, discussing injuries and late scratches. There, the biggest storyline of the Red Wings' young season and probably the NHL season to date was the Russian Five, a unit made famous in Detroit some weeks earlier when Detroit had acquired Igor Larionov from San Jose for a draft pick and longtime Red Wings Ray Shepard, giving Detroit a total of five Russian players on its roster. Scotty Bowman, in an imaginative move that would be lauded as one of the great player utilization strategies of the era, assembled the five Russians together on a single line, Larionov centering Sergei Fedorov and Slava Kozlov with Vladimir Konstantinov and Slava Fatisov manning the blue line. Playing together, the Russian five played a puck possession style of offense reminiscent of old Soviet national teams, one which gave opposing team fits early on in the regular season. In their first game together, an October 27, 1995 road game at Calgary, the Russians had toyed with the home team, tallying 15 of Detroit's 25 shots on goal, while the Flames, relegated to chasing the puck, recorded a franchise low 8 shots on the night. Fatisov was a scratch for the Saturday night game against Dallas, 
but the remaining four Russians, heavily involved in all facets of the game, made their presence the focal point of watching the game. Neither team scored in the first period, creating a comfortable lull for a short time that helped me further recover from the Michigan loss, but the Russians started the scoring early in the second. Three and a half minutes into it, Detroit went to the power play via a holding the stick call, and Igor Larionov capitalized a little over a minute into the man advantage. Two minutes later, Sergei Fedorov made it 2 to nothing Red Wings on a shorthanded breakaway, his sixth goal of the young season. Matthew Dandino added a third to give the Wings a healthy three-goal advantage going into the second intermission, at which time my parents called me up from the basement. Time to go home. Driving home from the Racines, Dad found the game on the radio for us to listen to while my brother and newborn sister slept in the back seat with Mom. We tuned in on time to hear Ken Kale call the fourth Red Wings goal, Slava Kozlov's third of the season, assisted by Fedorov and Larionov. And in that way, my imagination drifting off to the great onion-domed minarets of Moscow, the Red Wings all but made me forget the disappointing loss to Michigan State. In catching Russian fever, I was not alone that winter among Red Wings fans. For as long as I could remember, my parents, the Racines, and the Rivards had been spending Saturday nights together, and they were always events to look forward to. Dad, Jim Racine, and Dave Rivard were childhood buddies dating back to their Dearborn Divine Child school days and they had been watching Red Wings games together on wintry nights, in bar rooms, basements, and at the Joe, for longer than I could comprehend. They played beer league softball in summer, and closely followed the Detroit Tigers, watched college football in the fall, and then the Red Wings in the winter and spring. Gradually, their girlfriends and then wives fell into the routine, becoming close friends themselves. My mom, for instance, was best friends with Mrs. Racine and Mrs. Rivard. <clears throat> we kids were relatively new to it all, though, still learning about the magic of their Saturday nights when the grown-ups broke out of their work week costumes. Usually, these parties rotated houses. We hosted one in early December 1995, about a month after the Michigan-Michigan State game. The Red Wings were set to play Montreal in the primetime Saturday night slot, televised on both Fox Sports Detroit and CBC for Hockey Night in Canada. At dusk, Dad cranked up the living room stereo. John Mellencamp sang a little ditty about Jack and Diane, that inspired Patrick and I to jump on the living room couches like banshees, and we ran around the main floor in a locomotive frenzy for paper and fire. <clears throat> Mom wiped down the countertops with cleaning spray, arranged ceramic bowls on the kitchen table with bean dips and salsas, vacuumed the floors and staircase, and lit candles that smelled of bonfires and evergreen. In their bedroom, Mom and Dad danced between their walk-in closet and the bathroom mirror, sipping beers in between hygienic tasks. Mom's hairspray and Dad's deodorant spray clogging the air. Patrick and I watched the whole scene unfold with intrigue. Their excitement was contagious. The doorbell finally rang. Patrick and I took everyone's coats at the door nodded politely and said hello, and soon the house self-segregated like a middle school dance. The moms congregated in the kitchen over glasses of red wine and cocktails, gossiping. The men submerged in the basement, watching the hockey pregame over Molson's and Budweiser's. The kids roaming freely about the house, looking for mischief. 
I played with Jimmy Racine, David Rivard, and Patrick in the hour leading up to the game, drinking sodas and watching Snick on Nickelodeon in the living room. But I made sure I was in front of the upstairs television before the game started. The TV in Mom and Dad's room had only about seven channels via antenna, but CBC on Channel 99 was one of them, and I loved watching it for Hockey Night in Canada. Original six rivalries were always big games, but Montreal-Detroit that night was a marquee matchup made nostalgic by the fact that it was slated to be Detroit's last regular season game at the legendary Montreal Forum, home of the Canadians since 1924. The Habs planned to move to new quarters at the Molson Center at the end of the season. The pregame analysts noted that, although the franchise, franchises seemed to be trending in opposite directions, Detroit remained winless at the Montreal Forum since 1986 with a record of 0-8-1 that hearkened to their Dead Wings era, of which they still hadn't quite put behind them. Between the pipes, the goaltending matchup pitted two future Hall of Fame Canadians against one another. Mike Vernon, a native of Calgary, Alberta for the Wings, and Patrick Waugh of Quebec City for Mo Montreal. Nobody knew beforehand that it would be Wah's last ga game ever in the Habitant sweater, but that proved the biggest storyline in the post-game news conferences, in the morning sports pages, and the remainder of the season. What was supposed to be a routine night and goal for the two-time Conn Smythe winner proved anything but. Shoving aside Jimmy and Patrick's playful invitations and turning up the TV's volume knob, I watched the players and fans stand for both national anthems, America's First, then O Canada, sung half in English and half in French. To mark the occasion, legendary figures from both original six franchises were introduced at center ice for a ceremonial puck drop including Marcel Pronovost and Mickey Redman for Detroit, and Bernard Boom Boom Jeffreyon and Maurice Rocket Richard for the Canadians. The boisterous Saturday night crowd at the Forum gave the Rocket a standing ovation that lasted for several minutes, and the spectacle made boyhood games seem quite inconsequential. Perhaps the long pregame ceremony made the players restless. When the puck finally dropped, the teams barely had time to swap possessions before the serious action began. Only 30 seconds into the game, I heard masculine shouts and cheers echoing through the heat vents, coinciding with a fight near the Canadian's logo. Out at center ice, we've got Turner Stevenson and Darren McCarty, the announcer exclaimed, Face to face, Stevenson's got the height and the reach advantage, and the crowd's starting to react immediately. He had time to explain as McCarty and Stevenson grappled, sizing each other up. McCarty threw a number of lefts, but Stevenson answered, landing lefts of his own and eventually tearing McCarty's jersey off. I threw punches at the air. Slightly scrawny looking without a shirt for a fighter, McCarty threw haymakers to answer back, suddenly loose from Stevenson's grip. The fight continued on for a full minute at least before the referees broke them up and escorted them to the penalty boxes. And for a moment, a shirtless and short breathed McCarty resembled his predecessor in Bob Probert. The Montreal fans applauded both combatants, no one really sure who won the fight. Both McCarty and Stevenson received five-minute majors for fighting, which seemed a small price to pay for kicking off the game with an old-time hockey fight between two brawlers. As for me, the McCarty fight served as an impetus. Like cavemen, Dad and his friends roared from the basement, 
their drunken laughter echoing through the heat vents like a siren. What did I know of hockey or being a man? I felt compelled to be in their presence to learn what it meant to be a fan. Their inebriation permeated those walls, beckoningly. Approaching the basement stairs from the kitchen, all I could bring myself to do initially was listen through the crack of the basement door. I listened to the echoes of their chatter carrying up the walls of the staircase, and not wanting to miss the game more than anything, I tiptoed down the creaky wooden steps until I made it halfway down, just far enough to peek around the staircase wall. Neil Young hummed nasally from a stereo system, and the rapid-fire call of Dave Strader clacked like a typewriter in the background. The beer cans, white Buzz Budweiser cans with red and navy script lettering, mostly, and some Oxford Blue Strohs cans with a gold lion printed on a red emblem, seemed to make the, mo the room move. Empties overflowed from the old coffee table in the center of the living room area. There was even an ashtray, to my bewilderment. Dad and Jim Racine took sips from glass mugs in between turns tossing darts at a green and red checkered dartboard. The word cheer scripted above the circular target, while Dave Rivard and Dad's friend Joe Trahey took sips straight from the can, staring intently at the ancient box television set, antennas sticking out of it and all. Suddenly, the men threw up their arms and the basement erupted in cheers. Larianov scores, Strader shouted. Twenty seconds into the first power play and the Red Wings lead it one to nothing. It's Larianov who picked up his own rebound on the short side between the left leg and goalpost. Not a hard one. And the Red Wings open the scoring. Mickey Redmond added sprightly, having just arrived to the booth in cheerful spirits from his pregame honors. And yes, that is an octopus, thrown by a Red Wings fan in the building tonight, Strader interjected sardonically, the cameras cutting to the slimy cephalopod. At this, the men around me celebrated again. To my astonishment, Dad's mannerisms changed, even his facial expression. Sunken eyes that I had come to associate with his return from work, briefcase in hand, were lit up with joy. His voice had changed, too. That happy calm emerged in his speech, and he laughed easily, something he rarely did during the week. Downstairs in the basement, I started to learn about the magical effects of alcohol. There was something in those beer cans that brought out more happy-go-lucky versions of my dad and his friends. I felt almost invisible to them. They said what they pleased and spared me no curses. At some point, I found a seat on the ratty old sofa between my dad and Mr. Rivard, who smelled like fresh cigarette smoke. Detroit controlled the flow of the game early through the first period, keeping persistent pressure on the Canadians' blue line. Then the game appeared to settle down around the eight-minute mark of the first, with Vernon making a big save on one end to keep it a one-goal game. Then the Russians struck again. On, on set-up passes from Vladimir Konstantinov and Igor Larionov, Slava Kozlov slammed home what was practically an empty netter. Beating Patrick Waugh on the same short side of the goal, Larionov had scored on earlier, making it 2 nothing wings. From then on, the action continued almost unabated. 20 seconds after the Kozlov goal, the referees sent Keek Primo to the penalty box for obstruction, and 30 seconds after that, Mark Recchi scored to cut the lead in half. A minute later, Kozlov notched his second goal of the period with assists from Fedorov and Mark Bergevin to once again give the Red Wings a two-goal lead. With each successive Wings goal, the men in the basement threw their arms up in applause, and by the third goal, I had joined them.
It was still a competitive game late into the first, by no means out of reach, with the wings up 3-1. to one. Then, with 3 minutes and 18 seconds to go, former Red Wing Eves Racine went to the penalty box for hooking. Already on the penalty kill, Patrice Brisebois did not do Patrick Waugh any favors when he subsequently drove Darren McCarty into the boards behind the Montreal goal, earning himself a five-minute major and a game misconduct. The tragically hip rocked from the loudspeakers at the forum, clearly audible over the silence of the home crowd. With a two-man advantage, it took Detroit only nine seconds to cash in on the power play. Nick Lidstrom on a slap shot blast from the blue line, with assists from Greg Johnson and Paul Coffey. And it took the same line, only 53 seconds more with a one man advantage, to score the fifth. Greg Johnson at 1901 on assists from Iserman and Coffey. At that, Fox Sports Detroit panned to the first of many shots of Canadians' backup goalie, Pat Jablonski. This building's in shock, Mickey Redmond mused. The Red Wings are just rocking and rolling offensively, and now they can smell blood. Detroit closed the first period 3-for-3 three three on the power play, toting a comfortable four-goal lead into the visiting locker rooms. Patrick Waugh looked obviously off his game, but for Detroit, it was nonetheless an impressive tally against one of hockey's best ever goalies. The Russian Five notching three of those tallies, Patrick Waugh's brother and biographer aptly summarized. The game looked like a meeting between the Red Army and the Fredericton Canadians of the AHL. Every goal in the first was a fine piece of work. It was probably a good time to change goalies. At the very least, it was necessary to limit the humiliation at the forum on a Saturday night. At any rate, to the bewilderment of many, Patrick Waugh appeared in his crease to start the second period. With time still remaining on Bryce Waugh's five-minute major, Bowman employed the Russian five and running the power play unit, applying persistent pressure on Waugh throughout the power play. Sergei Fedorov and Slava Fetisov set up Kozlov with one second left in the penalty for his third goal of the young contest, a hat trick that silenced any optimism that had matriculated at the forum in between periods. To this, the sixth goal. Waugh cursed visibly and shook his head in disgust. <clears throat> Vernon made another big save on the other end. Steve Iserman intercepted a pass in the Red Wings zone, then chipped the puck to center ice, where Sherbrooke, Quebec native Matthew Dandenault was streaking to open ice. Dandenault, who needed 26 tickets to accommodate his local friends and families for the game, mishandled the breakaway attempt on Waugh, but the puck got caught in Waugh's pads and ultimately trickled in. That made it 7-1 to one Red Wings. Waugh helplessly looked to the bench for relief, anticipating the traditional hook of a goalie on an off night, another unwritten rule of hockey which my father took the time to explain in real time. When he received no help, Waugh understood he'd been hung out to dry. Two odd minutes later, Sergei Fedorov, who had already accumulated two assists on the night, blasted a 60-foot slap shot from the blue line, which the B-leaguer netminder kicked aside easily. The save prompted mock applause from the Montreal fans who hadn't made their way to the exits early, to which Waugh, historically hot-tempered, threw up his arms in mock retort. Perhaps sympathetically, Scotty Bowman released his fourth line into the foray, foray midway through the second, but even they got in on the action. Keek Primo and Bob Rouse assisted on another Greg Johnson goal to make it 8-1. to one. 
After the ninth goal, scored by Fedorov two minutes later, first-year coach Mario Tremblay finally gave Wa the hook. The move was so late that it could hardly qualify as merciful. Enraged, Wa exited the ice, found his way to the backup goalie stool behind the Montreal bench, then paced past Tremblay, inviting an apology. When he didn't receive one, Wa walked up to Montreal President Ronald Corey, who was behind the bench, and declared, It's my last game in Montreal. Wa again found his stool, then shouted in the direction of Tremblay, You heard me. In all, Wa had allowed nine goals on 26 shots, though he could scarcely be blamed for many. Detroit went on to score two more against Pat Jablonski to give Detroit a lopsided 11-1 victory in their last ever visit to the Forum. Kozlov scored his fourth of the night later in the second period, and Dandeno scored his second of the night in the third. Collectively, it was a big night for Detroit, perhaps even a turning point in the season, but Patrick Waugh wouldn't forget it either.